So welcome everybody to uh, the last uh, genomics HEAS lecture of this term. Um, and we are very pleased to have Thomas Marquez here, uh, Thomas Marquez Bonet, who is, uh, well, an eminent scientist from Barcelona. <laughs> um, he, he did his PhD in Barcelona, uh, followed by a postdoc at the um, University of uh, Washington in Seattle. And since 2010, uh, he's a professor at the Universitat uh, Universitat Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona, um, where he started with an ESC starting grant uh, in 2010. And since then, he had multiple other grants and um, recently an ESC consolidator grant as well. And um, his his work in uh, uh, many directions um, led to more than 200 publications, I think, uh, over time. Um, so he is uh, a leading primate genomics researcher. Um, so more than 200 publications and I think even more projects <laughs> that mm -hmm. Thomas was involved in. Um, of course, not leading all of them, but involved in many as well. Um, and I think, yeah, moving from primate genomics to to omics of, well, all omics basically. Um, um, but I think he will talk about um, the results from, from the latest large study on primates um, that was published in a special issue in Science just two weeks ago, um, which uh, is probably a, a very nice achievement to, to have a special issue in Science after, of course, having already a couple of papers in uh, journals like Science and Nature. And yeah, I'm very happy that you're here, Thomas. And uh, of course, I'm very happy because uh, you were my P uh, my sorry my postdoc supervisor for several years in Barcelona, and uh, I have of course learned a lot from you before coming here and starting my own group in Vienna. And I think we're all looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Martin. And 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 considering that that you have precisely PI duties in in a few minutes, let me start uh, by saying something that I was planning to say at the end but I want to say it with you uh, here. Uh, most of the work I will be presenting today, uh, it will have been impossible without Martin. So those of you that have interacted with him, you know how brilliant and generous this guy is. I, I am really happy that Vienna was his so far final institution uh, so he can develop his research. You guys has someone really valuable, both as a human being, as a scientist, and I really want to show my appreciation towards him and the work that he did, not just to me, but to many colleagues here in Barcelona. So Martin, many, many, many thanks. Thank so let me, start, <laughs> let me start by sharing the screen. Okay, so that's, can you see the screen right now? Yes. yes. Okay, fantastic. So let me see if I don't see that many uh, windows because I have a lot of uh, height floating meeting controls, yes. Okay, now I can see that. Okay, so thank you so much, everyone. And thanks, Ron. Thanks, Martin, for the invitation. Again, it's, it's, it's not just a regular talk. It's a, it's a very special talk because I have the feeling, I have the pleasure to tell you a bit about my research among very esteemed colleagues. And, and of course, I include uh, all of you in that in, 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 the, in the team. So, so just as a general introduction, let's see right now, yeah. Uh, in, and that was a decision I took uh, 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 now a few years ago, more than a decade ago. Uh, what we do is we study primates and apes. And that was uh, a decision that was intentionally decided when I went back from the, from the United States. And in my mind, and this is something that maybe when we will get to the uh, recent papers, uh, you will see that I, I think finally that has proven to be true. I always consider uh, an interest, a, a particular fascinating, fascinating interest to study primates and within primates' aids. And the reason for that is very obvious, but even if it is obvious, I would like to restate here. Uh, humans are primates. Uh, primates are our closest relative with whom we share the most recent common ancestor, and we share a lot of genetic we share a lot of physiology, we, we, we share cell biology. So studying apes and primates, it's one 
of the primary goals for everyone interested in comparative genomics, even from a selfish perspective of trying to understand human biology. But on top of that, if you are a zoologist, as I am, uh, primates have a, a, a many different things that makes them a very particular interesting system to study. Uh, most of them, 60% of them are in danger, according to the red list of the IUCN. They live in all kinds of habitats. They have a lot of associations, trade associations, ecological associations to study. So there are a lot of things to learn for them and for them, for their conversation, uh, conservation. So this combination of a particular fascination for the animals on top of how useful I believe they are to understand our species is precisely what motivates the line of research in the lab. So my interest, uh, in gen generally speaking, I will put them in, in three areas. Uh, today I will be talking only about the, the, the first one, which is particularly population genomics, evolution and conservation and biodiversity. But in my lab, after we do a lot of uh, variant discovery and characterization, we want to understand the consequences of all this variant discovery. And that's the reason there are a substantial people in my group working with particularly gene regulation and epigenetics. We are doing cell lines, we work with tissues. And uh, in that particular angle, we always use the, 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 the comparative approach, human versus apes and primates. And finally, this is a small part of the lab, but it's still very valuable. And this is a part that I share very proudly with Ron and Martin now, is this idea of getting into historical events. And historical events go, means going back to the museum and seeing how was the diversity before we humans start just exploiting everything back there, or even using paleoproteomics, which, as you know, it, it allows us to go even beyond ancient DNA in order to study particularly fossils that are of interest, phylogenetically speaking, uh, uh, in order to, to better understand the evolution of humans and primates. So, so again, in the lab, you can see a recent picture in the lab right there. We essentially work on these two topics. One is genome variation and human evolution and transcriptomics and epigenetics in human and apes. Again, today I will be talking particularly on genomic variation. So before, before going to actual data, I wanted to share something with you, which again, uh, 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 I apologize if this is very obvious to everyone in the audience, but even if it is audio, uh, obvious, I, I think it's always worth to mention and stress. And what I'm going to share with you is something that, that I, I've, I've always wanted to do a, a visual plot of how my lab have been evolving in the last 10 years. And at the end, uh, again, please understand me well, this is not better, this is not worse of other methods out there. It has been the way that my lab has been following a route in order to achieve a certain level of understanding in a non-model animal uh, organism, organism, in this case, the apes, right? And, and, and the idea that we've been following for the last 10 or 12 years is the following, right? So we understand there is always uh, 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 some sort of genetic or genome variation, and that can be mitochondrial DNA, that can be uh, DD-RAT, uh, nuclear genome that can be microsatellites. And of course, for many organisms out there, this kind of genetic information is now pretty much uh, available. Um, with time, at some point, genome assemblies start. Uh, for apes, and, and particularly for chimpanzee, we were lucky that right after human and model organism, mouse, C. elegans, drosophila, and so on, Chimpanzee was one of the first genome assemblies. So that has given us a lot of time to think about what to do when a genome is generated. Uh, I am very well aware that for many non-model uh, animal organisms, uh, many organisms, they still are not at this stage, having a decent genome assembly to start doing other things. That's the reason I wanted to highlight again not to exemplify, but just to show what has happened in the case of the apes, in case this is helpful to, to other people. So I will say that, of course, right after the genome assembly, there is a phase on genome variation, but that's essentially uh, uh, 
in that's that's two areas. One is, of course, there is always a pan project where the genome reference assemblies is complemented with other haplotypes from the from other animals, and there is also a light genome variation by short read population resequencing on a few animals that essentially provide something that just a reference genome assembly cannot provide, which is a certain level of variation. But at some point, that is expanded. And that is expanded when you can start to survey all populations or the major populations on the distribution of that species in order to be sure that we or one uh, just capture all the diversity out there with many different applications, as you will see later. I would like to highlight that on top of, of that, and maybe I didn't know how to illustrate that well, so I put it at the bottom, but in parallel of all this effort of generating variation, there is always, or there should be always, in my experience, functional data sets. So transcriptomics, epigenetics, chipset, proteomics, and all of that. And that can happen at any stage during all these phases. At the end of the day, all of that allows us to do different things, right? Uh, in my opinion, of course, just to do comparative genomics, genome assemblies are very well suited. And for many of the general questions, one individual well annotated is all what you need for comparative genomics. For more evolutionary questions, then you need certain level of variation on top of the assembly. And obviously, if you care about conservation, you would like to go to as much variation and as much geostratified variation as possible. And then, of course, the functional data sets essentially opens the door to a comparative omics in general from a functional perspective. In the case of the chimpanzees, um, that's something that we've been doing for a really long time. And again, I did benefit from a lot of previous work. There's been a lot of work on microsatellites, Y chromosome markers, and so on. 2005 was the beginning with the initial sequence of the chimpanzee. Uh, two, in 2012, there was a few resequencing on nine individuals. On 2013, and that was work that we did from the lab, there was the sequencing on then tenth of great apes generating diversity. And then in 2016, and Martin was heavily involved in this paper, we essentially used that resequencing to model certain degree of, 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 of population history. So essentially, uh, uh, and, and what, when you are reaching this stage of having a few uh, whole genome sequence on a given species, you can start to do very interesting stuff. Um, not just uh, describing the diversity that is out there in order to better understand the complexities of their historical lineages, but for instance, this is something we did in 2016, which is the modeling, uh, the demographic modeling of chimpanzees and bonobos. And this is where we found that not today, but in the past, there was historical integration between bonobos and chimpanzees. We saw at that time some very light level of geographic stratification by country, not in all subspecies, but clearly in some of them. And also another work that Martin led and that was fantastic, this idea of using the modeling and the diversity to find introgressions from extinct populations into bonobos today. So the question is, where do we go from here? Um, clearly, we have several ideas, and this is what we've been working in the last years. Uh, one of them is to extend this level of analysis to other individuals, trying to reach that blue status in the pyramid that I did show about how rich and how can we saturate the diversity out there by getting access to other individuals and uh, to extend, of course, the analysis to other primates. So these are going to be the main two parts of, of my talk regarding to new, new data. So regarding to new uh, data sets for chimpanzees, um, it was very clear in my lab, and this is a realization we had maybe more than five years ago, is that everything that I've presented so far was based on high quality tissue or blood samples. And yes, it was not easy but doable to get a certain number of samples, but it was very clear to me that if we wanted to interrogate the real diversity out there, 
there are territories that it is impossible to get high quality material from the field, from Africa. So that's the reason we did invest quite a long time and quite a few resources in order to generate methods in order to retrieve nuclear DNA from non-invasive samples, particularly feces, but also hair. Um, here on the left, you have three papers that there were different stages uh, that we put in order to try to optimize technically this procedure of getting uh, nuclear DNA. The, it is obvious, I think, that uh, uh, getting to working with non-invasive samples have a particular benefit. I mean, they are easy to, easier to obtain. Uh, there are way less legal implications working with feces than not with uh, body animals. Um, there is also a very good benefit, which is for most of the feces that one can get, you get a specific GPS coordinates for every sample, which this is not something that was easy to retrieve with blood samples, right? What is the problem? The problem is that both for shit hairs and, and, and feces, the amount of DNA that you can retrieve is really low, really degraded. So this is this essentially um, move us to the territory of ancient DNA. We are typically working with less than 1% of endogenous DNA and 99% of things that are not of interest right now, or it's not the focus of, 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 of this project. So that requires quite a lot of, again, technical development. So at the end, what we decided was the way to move forward was essentially work with biotinylated RNA baits and doing several captures, several extractions of DNA, several captures, uh, pulling together samples with equi-endogenous DNA and then go for sequencing. So we put that to work in a, in a major project and that was a, collaborate, a collaboration and, uh, from the people at the Max Planck. They had a magnificent, a magnific project that was the Pan-African pro project. That's essentially Jal Marmini and, and, and Christopher. And that project was led by Claudia, which she did an amazing job. And that was, of course, part of her PhD. Essentially, these guys had different sides of Africa. They had 46 different locations. And in every single of these places, there were a lot of metrics ecological metrics, physiological metrics, ethological metrics, and then they also capture uh, fecal samples. And essentially these fecal samples were used to target and reach for chromosome 21. Chromosome 21 is the smallest contiguous sequence in the chimpanzee genome. And we essentially design a series of baits in order to go from tip to tip of chromosome 21 and capture, and capture as much information as possible. So technically, this was really difficult. So um, you can see that on average, uh, we did five hybridization per sample. The amount of endogenous relay was really low. There was a median of 3%, but there were sites that were, we were really well below the, the the, the 1% or even less than that. And at the end of the day, you can see that the coverage we got per sample is really low. So at the end of the day, we were working with coverage of one to X per chromosome 21, but, and that is the advantage of such a sampling from 800 samples from 46 locations. Um, when you have this, this kind of data, you can do a lot of stuff. Um, but we, of course, started from the very beginning, which is defining at which four recognized taxonomical units in chimpanzees, that is the four subspecies, were uh, uh, identifiable by uh, genetics. Now that we have this very amazing uh, uh, data set, very well distributed in Africa, that might sound like very obvious to you. Uh, and that, of course, had been done endless times with genetics and using whole genome, but it's true that with microsatellites that have way higher mutation rate and at then they have a, a much more recent coalescent time, essentially we didn't see that pattern that clearly. There was a lot more connectivity between sites. And uh, something that is then interesting is that for instance, that Nigiri site that essentially was really close to, to central chimpanzees, 
uh, but they are considered Eastern chimpanzees. Genetically, we can clearly see that they belong to the group of within the Eastern dispersion. So at the end of the day, there was a, well, a good support for the identification of these four groups, even from a genetic perspective. So with this kind of data, and this was something that took quite a long to generate, we then wanted to assess the connectivity, the amount of haplotypes sharing that you can see among groups. And this is fantastic because only this level of sampling and genetic acquisition allow us to do that. And essentially what we were able to assess from a quantitative point of view is different corridors of exchange between chimpanzees, both in Easters or in Centrals, or the main barriers that have been separating some populations from, from others. There was something that, that I always had a, a strong interest on that. And, 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 and essentially that, that interest was because when I was talking about my evolutionary view on chimpanzees, uh, when I've been giving talks to a more conservation uh, organism, policymakers, or even of course, biologists and researchers, uh, people were insistently asking at which extent that genetic material will allow me to do geolocalization of confiscated samples. Uh, this is still the second major threat for great apes after, of course, habitat deforestation and reduction. But still today, there are thousands of animals that are being moved uh, out of their uh, region of origin. And this is a big problem. And legally, uh, it's really impossible today to determine the origins of these, uh, the, the country origins, which is the legal responsible for the parks and the problem because there are no forensic work in order to identify uh, the animals. So uh, we had some hints from previous projects, but it has not been until the finalization of this project that now we do have a really good data set in order to project new samples and try to identify where the animals come from. So this is just a schematic view from Marina. Essentially, the idea is that, of course, we use genetics to generate a data set of dispersion of data, particularly rare variants. And with this data set, then you can project new animals into there and assess the origin of these samples. So this is, this is part of the work that Martin led. Again, thanks, Martin. Uh, Martin essentially discovered that, of course, there is a lot of rare variation in these data sets. And he essentially put together the idea of use these rare variants in order to geolocalize rescue chimpanzees. And for that, we essentially work with two rescue centers in Spain, uh, Fundación Mona and Reinfer. And essentially, we were given feces and samples. And just with 0.1x of production, we were able to help them in order to understand the true origin of the animals. And I'm saying this true origin because all these animals had already some assignation, even at the level of subspecies and relationships. And something that we uh, have done work genetically with them, and we have, uh, of course, shown them that many of the animals, they thought they were related. They are not. They are even from different subspecies. And now we can tell them pretty much exactly where the animals were uh, taken from, which is really a good beginning uh, to, at some point, start working towards an atlas of illegal trafficking for, for all the apes. So there is, of course, a continuation of the project. We have now in the lab three projects uh, that follows the similar uh, reasoning that you have seen. There is a big project on, on gorillas. We have now more than 400 samples. The difference between this project and the previous project that you have seen is that in this case, we have a lot of hair samples. And hair samples allow us to amplify the whole genome, not just chromosome 21, which is fantastic for runs of homozygosis, for gene repertoire, and, and all of that. And for instance, one of the recent papers that we published just a few months ago was a paper from Marina, where we essentially, and it's the first time uh, we were able to analyze many cross river genome gorillas. Just uh, up to today, there was only one a single uh, whole genome of a cross river gorilla, which is a small population up of the Western Lowland, uh, uh, <coughs> Western Lowland gorillas. <coughs> Sorry. 
And essentially in this manuscript, we confirm the singularity of this population. We see that uh, genetically they can be differentiated from Western lowland, something that with the single animal we had before, it was not that obvious. And most importantly, we see now long tracks of recent inbreeding in, 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 in cross river gorillas, which uh, interestingly, this population has been isolated and they do not have that high level of inbreeding that we saw in mountain gorillas or even Eastern lowland gorillas, but clearly they have higher levels of inbreeding compared to Western uh, lowland gorillas. So in collaboration with Michael Crutzen, which uh, uh, is a fantastic researcher that has spent many years both working in orangutan in Sumatran and Bornean, uh, we are working with his lab, particularly with Bibi. You know, we have generated more than uh, 700 samples from orangutans of all over the territory. In this case, we have also a lot of hairs. So we have a lot of low coverage, but whole genome information. And particularly something very interesting, we have 10 of the Tapaluniensis population that, you know, it was described as a new species based on the genetics of a single individual. And in this case, we believe that an analysis of, of the Tapaluniensis uh, information is going to be very interesting in order to properly uh, put an evolutionary and taxonomic perspective on this population. And finally, in Bonobos, uh, and that's a collaboration with many people, uh, Jalmer, Christina, and Beatriz, particularly, we have now 200 fecal samples. In this case, we follow the same protocol. We capture the chromosome 21, but in this case, we, we capture the exome as well. So the whole repertoire is included in, in, the, in the production of this data. So we can really make a good use on, on this production. And, and we are starting to see some uh, clustering between Eastern and Western bonobos. And there are many interesting things, even considering, of course, the, 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 the particular integration with, with chimpanzees and among the different populations. So this is a bit what uh, uh, my lab will be doing for, for the next years. So let me, let me briefly uh, change gears here. But uh, um, remember that when I did my introduction about um, how variation essentially help us to better understand the world that we live in, but specifically the primates. Um, I, I showed two ways where we are, uh, you know, moving forward. One was, of course, this idea of more individuals from a species for which we already have the reference genome, the uh, a slight uh, variation, but we wanted to essentially have more variation. Uh, and now what I'm going to show you is essentially the work that was published two weeks ago. And essentially the idea was how can we start? Because for still today, uh, many species, we have almost nothing, but how can we start uh, characterizing the diversity in all primates in the world? And this is, this is essentially a fantastic project that, that essentially it starts with Kyle at Illumina that essentially in, in uh, asking me to coordinate this very big project on primate diversity. Uh, that was done in collaborations with Jeff Rogers at the Baylor College of Medicine. And the three of us has es essentially just put together a, a very impressive team of people. But I will, of course, would like to recognize Lucas, Lucas Kuderna, who was a postdoc in my lab at that time. And he has been the major force uh, coordinating everything that you will see in the next slides. So when we start the project, and this is, this is, a, this is a, a review that we published in, two, in 2020, so not that long ago. And by 2020, there was only pretty much 50, 50 something uh, uh, primates uh, that had reference genome. And reference genome, it was most of them, you can see all the red dots here, it was still short read base. So we were talking in context really small, really fragmented, but hey, still it was a reference genome, right? Um, one ha has to consider then pretty much depending to whom you talk, but there is between 400 and 500 primate species in the world. So that means that by that, by that, by that time, 
there was only like 10% of the primate genomes that had uh, any sort of quality uh, reference genome to work, work with. So essentially, and that's the credit of particularly these people, and I would like to acknowledge Jan, Christina, Katrina, Amanda, Dr. Mapati, Jessica, Lim, and Julie, these guys have been the, 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 the major force behind the project because these guys essentially put uh, for the benefit of this project and to the community, their lifetime collection. And you can see here below, this, each dot is a centroid of a species habitat or a species uh, limitation. So essentially you can see here how many uh, species did we sequence. And I am particularly proud uh, to be able to sample very deeply for the first time the Amazonas. And that's thanks for, to Jean Boubli, which I would like to recognize his effort. And that essentially has given a really good view of new, new world monkeys. So the data set is essentially a very complete data set, including uh, 800 high coverage uh, whole genome sequence. Uh, high coverage means higher than 30x, of which more than 700 was generated de novo and in purpose for this project. So compared to the graph I had before, that is essentially a fourfold increase compared to what was available at that time, because essentially we cover uh, 237 species, 233 at some point, depending uh, uh, on the quality of some samples. But uh, uh, we were able to cover most of the genera and clearly all the species, which something that really uh, uh, I think deserve uh, 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 some credit because it allows us to do something um, that it was not possible before is that for 36 species, there were more than five different unrelated animals. And this is very valuable to start digging into certain patterns of diversity, right? Um, what do we do with that? Well, um, um, you can do lots of things and that's the reason why there was there were different papers and in different papers we were talking about different things in one of the papers of course uh, we explore the biodiversity from a genetic perspective we wanted to explore whether at continental level there was some differences whether there within families there were some differences and of course there are something that it's been in the field for a really long time and now we have the data to answer that is at which extent the IUCN red status correlates with genetic diversity and runs of homozygosity. And I have to tell you that overall in the order of primates, there is no correlation between the threat status and genetic markers. However, internally, uh, there are certain families for which we do see this difference between threatened and not threatened. And for instance, the amount of runs of homozygosity. Uh, in that paper, also something. This is this is uh, uh, Lucas's paper, and in this paper, we describe the data set. We make all this general characterization of the data, and something that maybe for this community will be more interesting is that um, essentially. Oh, I'm, I, I'm, I'll go here and then I'll go back one slide. Essentially, something that we did, and that uh, Martin again was heavily involved in that part of the project, is essentially to narrow down the amount of mutations that are considered truly human specific. So before this project, of course, the definition of human specific was based on, of course, human and Neanderthals and that small set of primates available. When you add to the picture 230 new primates, you can count amount of truly human specific amino acid substitutions. And what we found is that almost half of what we thought before it was human specific, it was not. It was shared at least with one, many times two different lineages of primates. So at the end of the day, we have now, and that's part of the paper, a list of 80 genes for which we see with the data we have today, truly specific amino acid changes. Um, again, this, this, this data set, uh, was also very useful to recreate a phylogeny 
now not with partial data, but with whole genome data and sometimes with many individuals. Um, pretty much the phylogeny recapitulates very well the taxonomy, but there are certain instances here in black arrows where essentially we, see, we saw some discrepancies between what we see genetically and the taxonomy that is currently being used. Um, I, want, I want to be very clear about that. I am not saying that genetics should uh, make changes in the taxonomy. I think that genetics is just yet another factor that contributes to a view on, 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 on an artifact, which is how we classify life on Earth today. But clearly, we wanted to highlight that when one adds whole genome information into the taxonomy today, there are certain places that, that where we see just simply a small change, but still change in, in, in the taxonomy. Um, so I, I would like to acknowledge here Jeff, uh, because Jeff has been working for a really long time on baboon genomics. Baboons are really fascinating organisms. Uh, oh, I forgot one. Thanks, Martin, here, because uh, Martin was also very much involved into certain analysis in this, in this, in this project. But essentially, baboons are fascinating organisms. Uh, you know, there are many species of baboons. They live in Central Africa. Uh, they have many parallelisms with human evolution. It's really complicated. Uh, 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 evolutionary history. We know there's been plenty of gene flow between all of these species. And I am really glad that uh, with this uh, effort of sequencing hundreds of animals, we were able to put some novel insights into the classification of baboons. Uh, we found, which is something not unexpected, but it's good when you actually see it, that some species of baboons have received ancestry from three different um, um, other uh, populations. And we can really start working on models of, 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 of the history, demographic history on the baboons. And, and, and of course, finally, and that was the part that uh, Illumina working with different clinicians had interest uh, was how does, vari how does vari this variation compare to the human variation. So here on the top right, you have a paper. It's a nature review. Uh, it's a nature genetics paper from 2018. And this is essentially one of the forces that trigger this project. In that paper, Kyle <clears throat> was already showing that just the few whole genome sequences out there, because that was way before we started this project. Uh, in that time, there was only 100 of whole genome sequences from apes. And in that paper, Kyle was showing that the allele frequencies of primates was really a good discriminant whether a mutation was a driver or a passenger in, 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 in tumoral tissue, right? So um, um, the idea is that if when you are screening thousands of variants in a new disease or a new tumoral tissue, essentially, we need methods to rank those that are just benign, just neutral, just passengers from the causal mutation. And well, looks like that primates, humans are primates, are really a good place to start. And the diversity in primates really help algorithms to rank uh, the, pot the potential uh, of damaging uh, uh, power of, of, these, of these mutations in human disease. The idea is very obvious. If a mutation that we see in a, as a candidate of a disease have never been seen in any primate, despite of 30 million of parallel evolution, and despite of diversities at the species level that are three, four, five times higher than humans, so we are giving natural selection the opportunity to create new mutations all over the human genome, if despite of that, we never see a mutation that is seen in a patient, the likelihood of that mutation to be pathogenic is higher than not if that mutation is seen consistently in, I don't know, 50% of the primates on Earth, right? So as simple as that. So essentially, Kyle and his team, with our help, of course, but it's Kyle, Kyle has been using the primate variation to rank mutations, whether they can be more benign or more pathogenic. 
And after they have this classification, they can use algorithms of artificial intelligence and then using other variables in the human genome to make good predictions from now on what to look in a genome in order to try to find uh, potential damaging mutations. And, and not just that, another uh, something that isn't published, but we are working on that is uh, we have generated multiple sequence alignment on reference genomes from all the species. And of course, this is now being used in order to predict conservation of every really small windows across the human genome. So this is, uh, has a consequence, of course, to illustrate us about functional characters that, you know, it's been untouched uh, in humans and primates during million years. So that, of course, is the foundation to some regulatory things that we would like to, to, to look in the, in, the, in the next years. So the project has not stopped. So the project has continued and we are now uh, starting the analysis for, from what we call the phase two of the project. Uh, similarly to, to what happened to me in, in the chimpanzee project, we are now expanding not just more high quality samples, but we are also doing what we can with lower quality samples. Not everything, so not feces, but clearly we are working with FTAs, we are working with ancient skins and so on. Um, the idea is to try to generate as much uh, variation as possible. Uh, as you can see, the number of species grows slowly. And this is something that we anticipate, but reaching the 200 was not easy, but doable. But getting the 200 to the 400, is going to take really a long time because there are species that will be really difficult to get samples for sequencing. But still, we are increasing the number of species. And what is fantastic is that now one third of all the species sequence, we do have plenty of individuals to do population genomics. And essentially, uh, there are, I would like to illustrate this point with just two projects. Uh, that Joe working, that was a postdoc in my group, now a PI in Canada. And essentially, uh, Joe is finalizing a manuscript on the strepsirrhines. The strepsirrhines has always been complicated because we had less reference genomes available. And th th these are a particularly interesting set of animals. And essentially, Joe is finalizing a paper on the diversity and adaptation to, uh, to ecogeographic adaptation to wet and dry forest with 160 individuals of high coverage from 48 uh, different lemur species. Uh, another example of the kind of work we do, and that is very close to publishing as well, it's for instance, uh, animals that for particular reasons are, are, are interesting and that we believe genetics or genomics can contribute. And one of them is the cacajau. Cacajau is an endangered species there uh, in the Amazonian. And this has been a collaboration with Felipe and Jan and Nuria, a PhD in my group. And essentially we had 54 geolocalized samples covering all the distribution of the different species of, 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 of uh, wakaris, the cacajau. And essentially uh, in that particular paper, we had an hypothesis and this is what we have worked together is at which extent the major rivers in the Amazon are acting as a genetic barriers between all these populations and what kind of movements, genetic movements now and in the past we have seen in these species, right? So I think I will leave it here. Um, um, if that's okay, I really would like to thank Martin, uh, Claudia, Esther, uh, Lucas, and Joe for most of the work that you have seen. Uh, the people of the Pan African, Kyle, Jeff, the people in my group. And as you can see here on the right, the many, 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 many different people that has contributed somehow uh, in all these projects. And, and of course, I would like to thank as well the, the, the different funding agencies that are supporting this. So thank you so much.